Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello there. I'm your host, Simon Wimes here. One of my writers, this case, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Graham Young, the teacup poisoner, is who we're talking about today. I don't think I've ever heard of this one. Oh, it's English, though. I suppose Graham Young does. Well, does he sound English? I feel like Graham Young could also... I don't know, some names are typically English, and then I saw this was English. Oh, you know what's making me think of Englishness? It's teacup. I'm like, this gave English vibes, and then I see England there in the first word, and I'm like, oh, that title's got English vibes. It's not the name. It's the court back that he's called the bloody teacup poisoner. Teacup. Afternoon tea. It's very British. What about elevensies? Luncheon. Afternoon tea. Dinner. Supper. Let's just jump in, shall we? The format of the show, if you're new here, is Matt's written this for me. I've never read it before. We're going to explore it together and find out all about someone who's poisoning people. Let's go. On the 14th of June, 1856, Dr. William Palmer of Staffordshire, England, was led to the gallows to be hanged. By this point, he had spent over one year in prison awaiting this day, but before stepping to the rope, he looked down at the trapdoor on which he would soon be standing and asked the prison's hangman if it was sturdy. Minutes later, the doctor died in front of a crowd of 30,000 people. Throughout his life, Dr. Palmer often found himself heavily indebted to those around him for various reasons, primarily his love of gambling and betting on the horse races. (laughs) Why was he so in debt? I was addicted to gambling. Uh, (laughs) Obviously. I mean, people are in debt, obviously, for other reasons than that, but like, gambling is a disaster. We talked about this before on the show, but gambling, I'm like, it should obviously be heavily regulated. And then the internet came along and it's like, holy sh**. Just like so much gambling on the internet made it so easily accessible. And it's just like, I don't know, I just don't like it at all. And also in the UK, it's like one of those things where like, oh, well, I don't like smoking very much, but at least the government makes loads of money off it. In the UK, it's like, no, you go to the casino, it's all tax free. You don't have to make taxes on gambling winnings. What the f UK? Get that shit together. Start taxing the shit out of that. Be like, yo, 50%. <laughs> Why the f not? People will do it anyway. And if they don't, good. It's a win win. Get that shit together, UK. Come on. Boy, that escalated quickly. However, despite this, he always found a way to make ends meet and avoid the consequences of an increasingly risky behavior. That is, until in the years that immediately preceded his death, those debts became overwhelming. Well, don't worry about it. Just borrow more money and go gamble it at the casino and you'll make all of it back and pay off your debtors. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, there's a, there's a flaw in that plan. He's probably tried it already many times. It's just like, no, just a little bit more blackjack and we'll get there. Uh, how's our Bitcoin mining operation going? One year before his execution, when the doctor was 31 years old, he attended a horse race alongside his friend John Parson Cook and used the last of his remaining money to place a series of large risky bets in a large last-ditch effort to avoid debtors' prison. I literally didn't read that ahead, and he's doing exactly what I suggested in a joking manner. Oh my god, when you're so far in the hole, you're just like, well, there's only one way out, and it can't possibly get any worse, except it can get worse. And also in the past, there was debtor's prison. It's like it's not just like, oh yeah, it's going to ruin your life, and you're going to go bankrupt, and then it's going to be a horrible time. It's like, no, 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 they'll put you in inside a prison and make you work it off for years. <laughs> oh my god, it was a past, everybody. Look, as much as I think, you know, there should be more regulation around gambling, I don't think we should put people in debt in prison. These bets, unfortunately, did not pay out. However, Kirk, who had also bet that day using part of a £12,000 inherited fortune, won big. When all was said and done, Cook talk walked away with the promissory notes for an additional £3,000 from Palmer and many other race attendees. Oh my lord. Over the next few days, as Cook began to collect on these debts, he suddenly became inexplicably ill, and Dr. Palmer took charge of his care. Uh Uh-oh, conflict of interest much? Soon after, he's like, no, 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 I took the Hippocratic Oath, I'd never kill you, my man. (laughs) Ignore that large amount of money that I owe you that I cannot possibly afford. Maybe if I heal you, you'll let me off, as I'm not letting you off. Fix me and we'll get it back. Soon after, the man died and his betting books, his winnings, and a large portion of his inheritance disappeared without a trace. Uh Uh-oh, Dr. Palmer, you're looking pretty f***ing guilty right now. And the fact that you'll be hung in a year speaks to, one, your guilt, and two, the fact that they hung people real quick back in the day. First time. It's like that Ceausescu, where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you've been a very naughty boy, and we're sentencing you to death. All right, out to the courtyard with you. <laughs> and your wife. Oh, sh- On his death certificate, Palmer wrote that Cook died of apoplexy. However, witnesses soon came forward claiming otherwise. They said Cook had expressed concerns to them shortly before his death that Dr. Palmer had been slipping poison into his food and drink. Yo, if someone's like, yo, my doctor is poisoning me, you should take that seriously. Because either that person's mentally ill or their doctor is poisoning them. Or they're just wrong. 
But that does seem unlikely. Whatever it is, you should definitely look into it. And at the very least, phone the hospital or phone the practice and just be like, I've got these suspicions. They'll be like, you're crazy. But we're going to look into it because that's professional responsibility. Would they look into it? I feel like they'd look into it. But then, because this guy's not a crazy person. It's not like he's in a mental hospital. He's just a dude who got sick. Apparently quite a rich dude. When was this? Like back in the day? 1856 and he inherited 12,000 pounds? He's rich. That's a lot of money back in the day. And obviously, rich people get taken more seriously. I mean, that's how the world works, right? During Cook's post-mortem examination, Dr. Palmer attempted to sabotage many of the tests that the coroner was performing by requesting to be inside the room during the time of the examination, showing up drunk and bumping repeatedly into the other examiners and stealing and hiding Cook's intestines so that they could not be tested for traces of poison. Dr. Palmer, what are you up to? No wonder you got executed. This is the sketch. You're a doctor. You've got, you must have at least a slightly big brain. Come on. Are you stupid or something? When the coroner demanded that he return the missing organs, Palmer then attempted to bribe the man with a £10 note, requesting that he document Cook's cause of death as natural causes. Look, I'll give you a tenner. <laughs> Just right on there. Apoplexy. Oh, it's all good. Unsurprisingly, Palmer was soon arrested for murder, and during his trial, the full details of his life, his debts, and the circumstances surrounding Cook's death were all made public. This was certainly bad for his image. However, what made it even worse was the revelation that death seemed to follow the doctor wherever he went. Uh-oh. I, I thought it was just Cook. Wait, he's been doing this for ages and he's this sh is it? How'd he get away with it for so long? In addition to his friends, Palmer's wife, brother, and four infant children had all died premature deaths under mysterious circumstances. And to add to the speculation, Palmer had collected life insurance payouts for both his wife and brother and hastily buried his children, listing convulsions as the cause of death for each of them. Dr. Palmer, you monster. You killed your children and your wife just because they're a financial burden on you. And then you took out like, dude, taking out the life insurance policy is like, it's, the only thing that's worse is like, yeah, he took out six life insurance policies on her about a week before she was murdered in, in suspicious circumstances. It's like, I wonder who killed her then. I wonder, was it the good doctor? I mean, it wouldn't be the good doctor. He's a surgeon. I am a surgeon! Once the, this information became public, people can't <laughs> anyone else was following that meme. <laughs> where it's like, I am a surgeon! I am a surgeon! I, I've never even seen that show, but that was hilarious. That was hilarious. I am a surgeon! Dr. Han! No, people might not know what I'm talking about. It was just some like meme months ago. But this might come out in like six months and people will be like, bro, Simon, your memes are stale, bro. But at the time, it's fresh. Once this information became public, people began to follow Palmer's case very closely as newspapers picked up on the story. Everyone wanted to hear and read about the cold-blooded family-killing doctor that may have had far more victims than anyone would ever know. This interest is what led to, as I said earlier, over 30,000 people attending his execution, which took place approximately one year after he was found guilty of murdering John Cook. In the years that followed, Palmer's story continued to grow in popularity and this is because, at the time, this was such a unique case. Doctors had murdered before, of course, but rarely was their motivation something as repugnant as money, and rarely did they kill their own families to settle debts. To further add to the mystique, the prison's hangman, George Throttler Smith, Oh my god, if you're if you're if you're a hangman and your name middle name your like nickname is Throttler, um I would be like I could have a different hangman. This guy's called the fing Throttler. Jesus. Thank you. He also sold one inch portions of the rope used on Palmer for five shillings each, and author Charles Dickens once called Palmer the greatest villain that ever stood in the old Bailey. A figure of Palmer's head was also added to the Waxwork Museum in Madame Tussaud's Chamber of Horrors and remained there from 1857 to 1979. After his death, Palmer's name had been spread far and wide, and by the turn of the century it had become legend, and with that type of notoriety, it should come as no surprise that his actions went on to inspire numerous other poisoners, one of which was the 13-year-old boy who was born approximately 90 years after the doctor's death. As a youth, this boy would attempt to follow in Palmer's footsteps by learning everything he could about chemistry in the human body. He would experiment on his friends and family, poisoning them with the various chemicals that he'd get his hands on. And later, as an adult, he would permanently alter the lives of his co-workers by dosing them for months, taking detailed notes of their horrific symptoms as he did so, until they eventually succumbed to his poison's agonizing effects. That is psycho. It's like, yeah, how's Pam doing to that? She's lost more of her hair, has she? I wonder what's happening to her. Oh no. And what's happening to Jim? Oh, his legs have fallen off. I wonder what's happening to him. And he's furiously scribbles it down in his journal. This boy's name was Graham Young, but by the end of his criminal career, he'd be infamously known as the teacup poisoner. Wait, this video's not about the doctor. Oh no. I know I talked about Graham Young in the beginning, but I'm like, oh yeah, this is about Dr. Farmer. And it's not. His story's over. He's dead and we're talking about Graham Young. <laughs> okay. The Little Devil when Graham Young was born on, I like the older ones because then it's like, it's like back in the 19th century and you're like, oh, these people and their family are long dead. It just feels a little bit more removed. But now we're in the 1940s. And I mean, that feels pretty removed. 
but he was born in 1940s. So he could, he could, I don't know if he's executed or whatever, but he could theoretically still be alive today. In fact, he wouldn't even be that old. He'd be 73. So he wouldn't even be at the average age of death yet, which makes it all a bit more modern. And then it's like, oh no, these people are still around and their families are still around. And I don't like that as much. Because <laughs> like when it's in the past, you're like, hey, yeah, and then he ate her skin. And you're like, yeah, but <laughs> it's in the past. It's fine. It's not though, is it? It's not. I don't know why I said that. Will you never learn? So he's born September the 7th, 1947 in Neesden, North London. He was surrounded by people who loved and cared for him. He had a working father named Frederick who provided for him, a caring mother named Bessie to look after and raise him, and an older sister named Winifred who was beyond excited about finally having a baby brother of her own. Overall, the family's future seemed bright. However, their bliss would be short-lived. Yeah, it's so sweet. I know. <laughs> there's, there's In the comments, it's like some people are like, Simon, we love it with the stories of your kids. And some people are like, Simon, stop bringing up your kids so much. It's like, I knew this would happen. I knew this would happen because as soon as you have kids, you're like, oh yeah, you do want to talk about them a lot. So I'm going to talk about them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just going to. Oh my God. Okay. It's happening. So my oldest is like the other day, we're just talking and she's, she's getting good with her words now. And she's like, um, I don't want to share my kids' names. So I'll just call them Jeff. My name is Jeff. And Dora. Hi. So Dora is the oldest and me and Dora are just having a chat and she's like, Jeff is my best friend. And I'm like, Jeff's your brother. <laughs> and she's like, also my best friend. And I'm like, oh, it's so nice. She loves him so much. And then sometimes she hates him when he plays with her toys. Peace was never an option. 14 weeks after giving birth to Graham, the young family suffered a tragedy when Bessie passed away unexpectedly after developing tuberculosis. It was an unthinkable scenario that left Frederick in charge of raising an infant on his own, a job for which he felt woefully unprepared. In order to continue working, and earning money to support his remaining family, Frederick was forced to send his children away to live with relatives. When Fred was placed in the care of her grandparents, while Graham was shipped away to live with Frederick's sister and her husband, Winnie and Jack. Over the next two years, Graham grew and matured appropriately. And while you might be expecting me to say that he suffered some sort of horrific abuse at the hands of his aunt and uncle, there's no direct evidence of this by all accounts. Losing his mother at such an early age, Graham became very close with Winnie and Jack, and the small family they'd created was off to a running start. However, just before Graham turned three, Frederick arrived at his sister's home to make an announcement. He said that he would be taking Graham back with him because he'd recently married a woman named Molly and decided that she, Graham, Winifred, and himself should all be reunited the way Bessie would have wanted. He was finally ready to bring his family back together and he could not contain his excitement. I have to say that's nice. That's nice. I'm from a step family like this and it's like, I don't know, I like that. It's like, it's nice and stable and not, like, at least it was for me and it's like, this could work out. That's what I'm thinking. And it's like, oh, it's not going to work out that way though, is it? And he's going to poison them because he's a psycho. <laughs> oh, and he's like the natural psycho because he's like, he's got this nice upbringing. I mean, relatively like it's stable, you know, for the most part. And it's the past that people die dying of tuberculosis left and right. It's fine. <laughs> It's not even that far in the past, though, is it? I feel like he's just poisoning people because he's like, you know, it's always that debate over nature versus nurture. And it's always that sliding scale. And we've had, I feel most people on this show, it's always like, well, they've got that natural tendency. But most of it is the fact that they're horribly abused. And then sometimes it's like, oh, no, they're really loving our upbringing. It's just like they don't feel anything and like killing people. And it's like, okay, <laughs> those people exist. That's terrifying. Now, just as was the case with his aunt and uncle, there is no evidence of abuse inside Graham's new home. However, this sudden change marked the second time in just three years that the boy's entire life had been uprooted. According to those that knew the family, Graham changed forever after being ripped away from his aunt and uncle. And while I can't blame Frederick for wanting to see his family reunited, there was likely a much better way to do this. The separation was a turning point that saw the bouncing, friendly tart morph into a scared, angry, vindictive child. Furthermore, Graham hated Molly as soon as he met her, and although he would eventually hide his disdain for her as well, he would never stop telling his friends friends and teachers how much he hated his horrible stepmother. Over the next few years, Graham began to develop some very strange interests, of which an all-consuming obsession with death, murder, and true crime was the most, most concerning. From an early age, he would spend hours poring over non-fiction accounts of people like William Palmer, the man he would eventually cite as his personal idol and other serial poisoners, such as Dr. Hawley Crippen, who was featured in the premiere episode of The Casual Criminalist. Yes, he was. Was he the dude who buried the people in his basement in his own pajamas? Was that Crippen? What a clown. It's like, you're a doctor. Use your slightly wrinkly brain. Come on. Deja vu. Graham was idolizing poisoners the way other children and teens at the time were obsessing over superheroes and early rock and roll singers like Elvis Presley and Cliff Richards. <laughs> He'd be like, who's your hero? Dr. Hawley Crippen. And people are like, who the f***'s Dr. Hawley Crippen? He's like, he's a 19th century poisoner. <laughs> be like, keep an eye on that one. Put him on that potential future serial killers list. Take his DNA and his fingerprints now. As he studied Palmer's, is Cliff Richard really that old? I know he's old, but holy sh**. 
Is he like, was he like successful at the same time as Elvis Presley? <laughs> Cliff Richard's still alive, right? Hey Siri, is Cliff Richard still alive? He's 82. He looks weird. It's like, he's one of those guys, he's still got like fully dark hair. Bro, it's okay. <laughs> It's okay, like, we know you should be grey. Look at your eyes. Oh, it's kind of like Uncanny Valley, isn't it? Sorry, Cliff. Sorry, Cliff. I didn't mean it, Cliff. You're a national treasure. You better watch your mouth, boy. As he studied Palmer's life, Graham learned how the doctor had used antimony to make his family members' deaths appear like accidents, and this excited him beyond words. <laughs> Ooh, I found a way to kill my family with no one knowing! How exciting, you psycho! And while there is no known reason for why Graham became obsessed with poison or why he wanted to do experiments on the people around him, Graham himself would provide some insight years later. He said that he simply wanted to feel the power that came from holding such a dangerous substance in his hand, the same feeling that Palmer must have felt so many years earlier. He wanted to experiment with antimony, and other poisons because he simply wanted to know what it felt like to take a life. It's like, why'd you kill? Want to know what it felt like? That is the most psycho shit that you've ever heard. Like, if you hear that, it's like, uh oh. <laughs> it's like, would you be interested in how it feels to kill? Yes. Alert, alert. <laughs> Now, we've heard this song and dance before on The Casual Criminalist, but what I feel makes Graham's case remarkable is that he started having these thoughts when he was only eight. Because of his obsession with Palmer, Graham took an early interest in anatomy and chemistry because understanding how the body worked was key to understanding how poison worked. He wasn't interested in just pouring a splash of bleach into the family's dinner or grinding rat poison into his sister's makeup. Graham wanted to possess a true understanding of poison because he hoped to someday develop his own poisons that were untraceable by standard medical tests. This required much more than a working knowledge of chemistry it required him to excel in a group of very different subjects. As such, Graham dedicated all of his free time to the sciences and let the rest of his studies fall by the wayside. Oh my god, what is wrong with you? It's like, yeah, I want to become brilliant at making poisons that are untraceable. I mean, there's probably quite good money in that, to be honest, but wait, what? <laughs> he's going to have to sell it on the dark web, untraceable poison. So I wrote that down. Eventually, Graham also expanded his areas of interest to include the forensic sciences of the time and begin learning everything that he could about decomposition and toxicology. Understanding these things, he believed, would be the key to ensuring his criminal career was a long one. Yes, that's right, before the boy had even exited primary school, Graham was already laying out his plans to become a serial poisoner. And if that little fact is not disturbing enough for you, he did excel in one other subject. German history, specifically 1930s and early 1940s German history, and its infamous chancellor slash dictator, a man whose name I cannot mention due to YouTube's censorship nonsense. <laughs> He's a Charlie Chaplin impersonator. He was particularly interested in the horrific experiments that had been performed on the people held in concentration camps during the time and the doctors who had performed them. If you're familiar with it, it's like, who's your idol? Cliff Richard, I love him so much. Who's your idol? Dr. Joseph Mengele. Ho oh, ho, sh**. I just love the way he experimented with twins. It's like, what the f are you saying, boy? Someone needs to put you in a padded room and keep you there. He even started wearing a particular shape on his arm and started trying to explain to his friends and family why Germany's self deposed chancellor was, and I'm paraphrasing here, kind of a chill dude. Bruh, you can't be just walking around wearing the, 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 the sign. The sign, you know the sign. It's a Buddhist symbol, it's like, bruh. <laughs> You know what it means. And I'm just, I don't know if that would get me demonetized. It begins with a swaster and ends in a knicker. <laughs> don't walk around wearing that. Yes, Graham Young was the worst kind of four letter word. And this was at a time when firing off a Bellamy salute wasn't just edgy teenager behavior, as almost everyone in Britain at the time knew someone who had died while fighting against that ideology. Oh, yeah, this is in the UK. For some reason, I was thinking, oh, it's America. Of course it's not. This is all happening in the UK. Can you do that in the UK? I think they'll arrest you for, like, um, what's it called? Inciting racial hatred, perhaps? Something like that? We should be. You can't do that. However, as if he hadn't already ticked enough boxes off of the serial killer checklist, oh boy, has he? Graham was also very interested in doing things that were inherently unscientific, such as the occult, the paranormal, and demonology. Once again, not in the edgy teenager way, but in the total psycho way. One day, after chasing and capturing one of his neighbor's cats, Graham gathered a small group of children from around the neighborhood to perform a ceremony that involved cutting the animal as he chanted in a made-up Latin-sounding language. This, of course, terrified the children, but Graham seemed to enjoy their reactions and was not concerned in the slightest about their opinion of him. Now realizing that his son was not exactly a normal child, Frederick attempted to fix Graham's behavior by encouraging him to focus on the positive subjects that he showed interest in, particularly chemistry. This is the thing, this dad seems like a good dad. I thought the next line was going to be, he tried to beat it out of him. And it's like, no, that would that would just make it worse. And instead he's like, try and find some other focus in your life rather than dissecting live cats. Oh no, he's like, he's the natural psychopath, isn't he? He knew that his son was smart and believed that if Graham was given a push in the right direction, he would have an undeniably bright future. And it's like, also, yo, yo, Graham, take off that f***ing symbol, all right, mate? He then gifted Graham an authentic 1960s-era chemistry set, which included real and dangerous substance that could be used for experimentation and to produce soaps and cleaning products from around the home. Yeah, that's what he's going to be making. He's going to be making cleaning products. 
Unless that cleaning product is bleach and he's pouring it in your eyes and down your throat. Um, he's not going to be making that. He's not going to be making other cleaning. He's not going to be making an air freshener, is he? Altogether, it was not a bad effort by Frederick. However, Graham instead used his new toy to harvest gunpowder from his father's stored ammunition, combined it with other substances to produce several small bombs, and then blew up a section of his neighbor's fence and one of the walls of his neighbor's shed. Jesus Christ, how big was this chemistry set? He's actually making explosives that can demolish a wall? With no internet? These actions and more earned Graham the unaffectionate nickname, The Mad Scientist. By 1960, the year that Graham turned 13, his knowledge of human anatomy, poisons, and toxicology had become so robust that he felt confident enough to conduct his first real experiment on a living person. In preparation, he contacted a local chemist who was working near his home and said that he was interested in purchasing some hard-to-acquire elements for an experiment that he was currently planning. The element he was searching for was Palmer's poison of choice, antimony. This uh, was a that, when utilized correctly, could be used to produce, produce certain medicines and cosmetics. However, as you know, Graham wasn't planning to compete with Maybelline. He wanted the powder for its other properties, the ones that produce an arsenic-like reaction when ingested. Because Graham was now so knowledgeable about chemistry, his plan to acquire the poison worked as he managed to convince a fully trained professional chemist that he was 17 years old and enrolled in university. Clever enough to use a fake name when reserving and purchasing the substance on the mandatory poison register, he wrote the name M. E. Evans. Yo, if there's a mandatory poison register, how about when people sign the mandatory poison register, they have to before produce some form of ID? Because otherwise you'd be just like, yeah, what's your name? Uh, it's Michael. Michael Hunt. Yeah, Mike Hunt. <laughs> Whoops, said that wrong. Yeah, Mike Hunt. Yeah, Michael Hunt. <laughs> That's what I'd write down. With the poison now stored inside a tiny glass. <laughs> That was like the most teenage joke that I've ever said. Oh, uh, with the poison now stored inside a tiny glass vial hidden inside his bedroom, Graham began vetting the people around him to select his first target. He settled on one of his classmates, Christopher Williams. One day, while in science class with Williams, Graham discreetly slipped the boy a small dose of antimony mixed with several other substances from his chemistry set and waited. He observed as Williams soon became unsteady, clutching his stomach and vomiting violently before being ushered out of the classroom. The following day, Williams was absent from school, and that was because he had been admitted to hospital and was being closely monitored by doctors as the toxins ravaged his body. He was suffering from severe stomach cramps and debilitating headaches that left him nearly immobilized. Fortunately, Williams survived the ordeal without suffering any permanent disabilities. Graham's dose had been too small to kill him, and much of the poison had been expelled through vomiting before it could fully take effect. However, Graham was also never caught or punished for this act because doctors were unable to determine the exact cause of Williams' illness. Yes, they assumed that he must have accidentally ingested something toxic outside the school or at home. Well, he's in a chemistry class, isn't he? Just be like, it's like it's a chemistry lab. There's all sorts of shit rolling around there, and he probably touched something. Disappointed that he had not been able to witness and document Williams' symptoms firsthand, Graham then began to re-strategize. He needed to choose a new target, one that he had better and more e direct access to. Uh, once again, he followed Palmer's example. Over the next few months, every member of the young family began to develop unexpected illnesses that lasted for days or weeks at a time. It was his stepmother, then it was his father, then it was his sister, and then, either by accident or on purpose, it was Graham himself. The boy had either accidentally dosed himself, or he was trying to confirm his father's belief that a stomach bug was causing the family's recurring health issues. These issues, which seemed to come and go at random, included intense stomach pains, vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, insomnia, and rapid weight loss. The symptoms were usually mild, however, sometimes they were so severe that one of them ended up being rushed to hospital. When this happened, doctors were unable to pinpoint the source of the family's issues because they had no reason to believe that a random family's stomach problems would be the result of long-term, small-dose metal poisoning. With no one to stop him, Graham continued administering these doses for months, and during this time, he meticulously observed and documented the effects that he saw. Graham was a scientist in the loosest sense of the word. However, as time went on, he began to grow bored of simply watching the family members cycle between sickness and recovery. He decided that it was time to take his experimentation to the next step. He was ready to take a life. Later that year, when Graham was 14 years old, he measured out a lethal dose of several poisons, mixed them together inside a cup of freshly brewed tea, and then served the foul concoction to his elder sister, Winifred, preparing for work early one morning. This sounds like a bad idea. Like, you're mixing poisons together. Isn't that just more stuff that's going to be discovered in an autopsy? According to Graham, he presented the tea as a kind gesture, but instead of downing the cup quickly, as the way he would hope she did, Winifred took one small sip, made a face, and then immediately dumped the entire cup down the kitchen sink. She said it was so sour she couldn't even bear to finish it, and asked him to never make tea like that again. She then rinsed her mouth, left home as usual, and boarded a train, heading to her workplace. 
Several hours later, Winifred awoke in hospital and was told that she had begun hallucinating while on the train, and several other passengers had stepped in to offer their assistance. They had called her a doctor, but when the doctor arrived, he was left puzzled by Winifred's condition. Her symptoms were truly strange, but the hospital staff eventually concluded that the girl must have come into contact with Atropabella donna, a plant in the nightshade family. The doctor wasn't sure where exactly Winifred might have encountered such a plant, but after hearing Winifred's story about the sour tea, Frederick had a theory. Yeah, I'd immediately be like, so uh, anything weird happened to you today? What have you had today? What have you eaten? What have you drunk? And then she'd list the things she drank, and then she'd be like, oh, I had that tea and it tasted horrible. And then, who made the tea for you? It was your brother. Your brother's poisoning you. Boom, prison, done. Easy. But it's not what happened, is it? Later that day, inside the family home, Frederick confronted his son and accused him of spiking Winifred's tea with something to make her sick, but Graham said that he had an innocent explanation. He'd been using the family's teacups to mix shampoo and claimed some of the chemical residue must have been left over in the cup when he served his sister the tea. That's a pretty smart excuse. And also, it's like, you're not going to poison your sister. That's what they're all thinking. This is a reasonable, that's the obvious explanation. Frederick, of course, didn't buy this story. Oh, sh- Okay, good for you, Frederick. I'll be like, yes, son, I understand. Although I guess he's like got a bit of a history of dissecting cats. So you'd be like, oh, God, my son's a psycho. I'm going to have to do the Dexter thing on him. Where it's like, look, I know you need to kill, son. This, this is how it'll be with, what did I call my son? What was his made-up name? My name is Jeff. This is how it'll be Jeff. He grows up and he's like, dad, I need to kill. And I'll be like, okay, son, you must only kill the bad people. <laughs> I'm not doing that, by the way. However, he came up empty. Graham had already hidden everything incriminating, including the poisons. After finding nothing, Frederick decided to take his son's word, and Graham was simply given a warning and told to be more careful when working with his chemistry set. This is a decision that Frederick would come to regret for the rest of his life. A death in the family. On April the 21st, 1962, when Graham was still only 14 years old, he succeeded in taking his first life, although it was not his sister's life, it was his stepmother's. On that afternoon, Frederick returned home from work and discovered Molly lying in the family's backyard, clutching her stomach and gasping in pain. He rushed over to her and saw that she was in complete agony. He immediately realized something was very wrong. These pains were not the same stomach pains that the family had been experiencing for months. She was dying. From inside the house, Graham stood in the upstairs window, looking down on them, taking notes. He did not care when his father called out for help, nor did he make a move to help when his neighbors arrived to transport Molly to hospital. Graham just watched. As soon as she arrived at the hospital, Molly began receiving treatments from doctors, but it was simply too late. She died that night and unknowingly became her stepson's first official victim. Frederick was devastated. Searching for answers, he turned to the coroner, who had examined Molly's body, but the man did not attribute her death to poison. He said that Molly had likely died from a prolapsed vertebra, which was a leftover injury caused by a car accident that she'd suffered about a month prior. However, as we're all aware, the true case of Molly's death was Graham's poison, although there was one key element that made this dose different from all the rest that he had given her. Graham had switched from antimony to thallium, another metalloid that is odorless, tasteless, and extremely toxic when ingested, inhaled, or absorbed through the skin. Graham had switched to thallium because he had noticed that Molly was building up a tolerance to antimony and, and became frustrated that she was not dying quickly enough. Where the f*** is he getting all this stuff? He's just, why can you go to a pharmacy or a chemist and be like, yeah, yeah, I'd like some antimony and some thallium. It's extremely toxic. And he's like 17. He said he was 17, but he's like 14. How is that allowed? I guess it's the past, so like all sorts of shit was possible. But wow, the past. Get your shit together. Now, there is some debate about whether Frederick knew or suspected that Graham was responsible for Molly's death. However, I don't personally believe that he was. As far as I can tell, the origin of this claim comes from the fact that Frederick insisted that Molly's body be immediately cremated, a request that some theorists speculate was his way of protecting Graham by ensuring no tests could ever be performed that may later implicate him. It's up to you to decide what you believe, but I wanted to mention this because it's a popular theory online. However, regardless of your opinion on that, there is one thing we know for certain about Molly's death. Graham was completely unaffected by it. He didn't stop poisoning his father or sister at any point, and he even went on to poison other members of Molly's family while they were in mourning at her funeral. Thankfully, nobody else died as a result of this round of poisoning, but her entire family did return home, believing they had caught whatever illness the young family was constantly suffering from. It weighed on their minds, as they wondered if this unknown illness had made Molly more susceptible to her car accident injuries, and if they, too, would suffer a similar fate. After the funeral, as the weeks dragged on inside the young household, Frederick and Winifred's health continued to worsen as Graham continued to perform his experiments on them. However, though he would not be caught for murdering Molly, he was about to make a massive misstep that would draw many eyes towards him. 
One day, after growing angry with his father for some unknown reason, Graham dosed Frederick with a larger-than-average dose of antimony and watched as the man became immediately ill, finally resorting to going to hospital after hours of agony. When he arrived, Frederick believed that this visit would be just like all the others. However, an astute doctor noted several disturbing signs that all pointed toward the unthinkable. He suggested that Frederick was suffering from a large buildup of metal molecules in his body and that this was likely the result of long-term metal poisoning. He then ran the proper tests, which showed positive for antimony, and said that had Frederick received one more dose, he would have died. Upon learning of his father's condition, Graham's science teacher became concerned after he recalled seeing several vials of unlabeled substances stashed away inside the young boy's desk. He then searched for it and uncovered an abundant evidence of Graham's actions, detailed notes about his experiments that spanned years, books and magazines about the poisoners Graham idolized, disturbing drawings that showed Graham's family members being dangled by their ankles over vats of acid, and of course, the poisons in themselves. How is this? I don't understand how we're like, what, a third of the way through? Barely. And he's not going to get caught right now. And that's it. Because this is absolutely slam dunk chaps. Come on. The teacher then brought his findings to the school's headmaster. And the two of them arranged for Graham to be interviewed by a psychiatrist. How about you arrange for him to be interviewed by the police and then a psychiatrist? However, knowing that Graham was likely clever enough to keep his mouth shut if he knew the man's intentions, the headmaster requested that the psychiatrist instead pose as a career counsellor. He agreed. The following day, the psychiatrist met with Graham inside one of the school's private offices for less than an hour before calmly excusing himself and phoning the police. During this short interview, Graham had both disproven his headmaster's theory and revealed his own greatest weakness. He was a bragger, since even without putting pressure on him, Graham had confessed to everything. His obsessions, his hobbies, his experiments. How is this not the end? Abundant evidence and he's just confessing it. He had even boasted about how much skill it had taken to dose his friends and family for years without being caught or accidentally killing himself. He didn't spare the man any details, and when the police arrived, Graham reiterated the exact same story. The only thing he didn't admit to was killing Molly. This is the end! Surely this is the end! Graham was then detained under Britain's Mental Health Act and transported to a high-security psychiatric hospital called Broadmoor to be further evaluated. He was analyzed by two more psychiatrists who each diagnosed him with several severe personality disorders as well as schizophrenia, although that latter diagnosis is hotly debated. Many believe that based on Graham's later behavior, he was exaggerating his mental issues to avoid the full responsibility of his actions. While all of this was happening, the police were meeting with Frederick and Winifred to inform them of Graham's actions. Finally, they understood what had been happening to their family, feeling a mixture of anger, heartbreak, and relief. Broadmoor in 1962, a judge deemed that Graham suffered from a lack of moral sense and sentenced him to no less than 15 years in Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital for the attempted murder of his father. However, he also said that Graham should remain there indefinitely if he could not be rehabilitated. Good, it's where he belongs. When Graham arrived at his new home, he was the hospital's youngest patient, and this fact gave the doctors hope that he could be rehabilitated. But if your Graham was eager to help himself while imprisoned, it would be very, very wrong. No, I'd just be like, why would he want to help himself? He just likes poisoning people. That's what he's into. He's just his brain is broken. During Graham's regularly scheduled visits with one of the hospital's psychiatrists, Dr. Udwin, he admitted that he desperately missed his antimony, and more so, he missed the power that he felt while using it. Graham didn't want to remain in Broadmoor, he said, but he seemed incapable of lying about his desire to poison, and Dr. Udwin quickly realized that his new patient had a difficult road ahead of him. As Graham settled in, he found himself in a truly miserable place where his every movement was monitored and documented. In letters he wrote home to his father, sister, and aunt, many of which went unanswered, he complained about the hospital, its staff, the judge who had sentenced him, and his fellow inmates. One inmate in particular, John Berridge, was a frequent thorn in Graham's side because he apparently snored very loudly. Weeks after Graham's arrival, John Berridge died inexplicably in his sleep. John Berridge was murdered, <laughs> allegedly in my opinion. During the man's post-mortem examination, it was determined that the serial snorer had died from cyanide poisoning, but the hospital staff were left clueless as they tried to figure out who had poisoned him and, more importantly, where the poisoner had sourced the cyanide. Where is he getting it? He's in, he's in Broadmoor. Cyanide comes from almonds, right? Like raw, like natural almonds out in the wild. Like, not the almonds you buy in the store, obviously. This was more difficult than it sounds because at the time, there were over 900 patients being treated at Broadmoor and almost every single one of them had a history of violence. Yeah, but not all of them have a history of poisoning. So that can be like, you can whittle that down. And then he's expressed that he doesn't like the guy because he snores too loudly. He poisoned him with cyanide. Eventually, the staff concluded that the cyanide must have come from outside the hospital because none of the property's plants could be used to produce it. However, Graham, who couldn't help but brag about his knowledge of poisons, informed them that laurel bushes could be used to produce cyanide, and those bushes were scattered all across the hospital's campus. <laughs> what are you doing? That's not just lying. That's like actively telling them that you did it. 
That's like confessing. It's not just like if they asked you, did you poison him? You'd be like, yeah. But they're like, oh, you didn't poison him because there's no cyanide on the hospital grounds. It's like, well, no, there is actually. What you need to do is you need to get this plant and you put it in a beaker. And <laughs> Bro. Now, even though Graham should have been caught once again due to his own giant blabber mouth, he was not. Many of the hospital's other patients had already falsely confessed to poisoning Berridge. Remember, this was a psychiatric hospital and such false confessions were common. And Graham's admission simply left him buried under a laundry list of other potential suspects. Eventually, John Berridge's death was ruled a suicide. <laughs> He was real, well, he died in his sleep of suicide. <laughs> Did he kill himself in his dream and it came real? And always forgotten. But there were those that suspected Graham, and the laurel bushes were eventually removed. Good idea when he got a poisoner on the grounds. Over the next several years, Graham struggled to keep a low profile. He was angry at the world and everyone around him, and he wanted to regain some semblance of the power that he once felt. He began borrowing medical textbooks from the hospital's library as he searched desperately for new substances, but he found none. His knowledge was increasing, but the tools at his disposal were few and far between. Eventually, however, he found an outlet. One afternoon while on duty, several of the hospital staff began feeling ill, but nobody could figure out why. Later, while searching for a common thread between them, the staff discovered that their break room's coffee machine had been spiked with bleach, which had been sourced from the staff bathroom. And although they didn't know for sure who had done it, they all assumed it was Graham. A joke then formed between the hospital's management and staff. Work harder, or I will let Graham make your coffee again. After this incident, Graham was then watched even more closely by the staff, and this increased scrutiny caused him to begin lashing out in even more extreme ways. As we've already discussed, Graham had very sympathetic views towards a certain 1930s-1940s German politician and decided to grow a very distinctive moustache to honor him. <laughs> Bro, what are you up to? Why'd you have to be a nut? as well. He also read and practiced the man's speeches <laughs> and carved hundreds of little wooden symbols that he littered around the hospital. It was concerning behavior, but when surrounded by even worse monsters than himself, Graham's actions went mostly unnoticed. Oh, he's just the little murderous n*** boy. Uh <laughs> I know it's definitely not a good time to be a Nazi. He's, uh, he's harmless, except for all the poisoning, and he killed someone. He made cyanide from the bushes. He should be like the number one. He should be in like the cell where they let you out for like one hour a day to go walk around in a concrete yard with nothing. That's where he should be. He should be in a glass box. Frustrated that he was not receiving the attention he desired, Graham made another decision. He really did not want to spend the rest of his life imprisoned within the hospital's maddeningly white walls, so he began playing by the rules for the first time since his arrival. And his plan worked. By Graham's fifth year at Broadmoor, more, Dr. Edwin began to feel that the now 19-year-old was making major progress. From what he saw, Graham appeared to be calming down, straightening up, and repenting for his actions. He hadn't been getting into fights either, nor had there been a single poisoning anywhere in the hospital for quite some time. He's like, no, no one's died for a while. He's finally stopped poisoning the patients. We should set him free! <laughs> Dr. Rudwin believed that should Graham continue to improve, he was a prime candidate to be declared fully recovered and could someday be released. This was an exciting prospect that Graham eagerly longed for. However, even though his freedom hung in the balance, he just couldn't help himself. He was still not in complete control of his actions, and several more attempted poisonings went unnoticed during his final years at Broadmoor. In one instance, he poured cleaning chemicals into his ward's community drinking fountain, which, had one of his fellow inmates not spotted him, could have ended up affecting nearly a hundred people. Wait, so one of the other inmates spotted him doing this? I guess they, you know, stitches get snitched or whatever. They'd be like, bro, don't try and poison us. Oh, for f**k's sake. <laughs> While this slip-up could have reset Graham's progress to zero, Dr. Adwin never learned of this incident because Graham's fellow inmates refused to rat him out. Oh, there we go, bingo. Instead, they administered a healthy dose of prison justice, which resulted in a long stint for Graham in Broadmoor's infirmary. <laughs> yeah, it's like, don't tell them, just beat the sh out of him. Stop trying to poison us, Graham. However, in June of 1970, after spending a full eight years in Broadmoor and celebrating his 22nd birthday, Graham received word that Dr. Udwin had penned a letter to his judge requesting that Graham be released early. Clearly stated in no uncertain terms that Graham was no longer obsessed with poisons, violence, and mischief. His request was granted, and Graham was given an early release date. Before leaving Broadmoor, Graham reported that he told a nurse that he would seek revenge on the world for locking him away. One life for every year he lost behind Broadmoor's walls. This threat went unreported because the nurse thought it was nothing more than a dark joke. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine dark joke. Unless you're a murderer in Broadmoor. Then be like, whoa, bro, not, is that a joke? He'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah it's a joke, nurse, it's a joke. I'm just joking, my nurse. Come on, it's just a joke. It's just a joke, isn't it? <laughs> He's gonna go murder eight people. Welcome home, Mr. Psycho.
After having officially beaten the system, Graham was released from Broadmoor in February of 1971 and promptly traveled 40 miles west to Hemel Hempstead, a town outside of London where his sister and her new husband were living. At this point, Winifred was overjoyed by her brother's release because she too had been assured by Dr. Udwin that Graham had made a full recovery. She eagerly accepted him into their home, giving him a place to stay so that he could focus on finding a job and getting back on his feet. She was, of course, nervous about having a reformed serial poisoner who had poisoned her staying inside their home, and these fears only grew when she learned that her father still wanted nothing to do with Graham. He was still, understandably, a little pissed off about Molly. Yet despite this, Winifred remained hopeful as she waited anxiously for her brother's arrival and hoped that eventually Frederick would come around after seeing that Graham was truly reformed. When Graham did arrive, he wasted no time dashing Winifred's hopes as she quickly realized that her brother still had many issues left to resolve. First, Graham may have been able to successfully hide his obsession with poison from her, but he was not able to hide the other, less than charming parts of his personality, such as his tiny little moustache and the ideology that it accompanied. So yeah, it's always like, I'm like, oh, he's a poisoner. Oh, he's also a neo-Nazi. Or is this, this back in the day? He's just a regular Nazi. <laughs> According to Winifred, Graham was still overly obsessed with 1940s Germany and spent many hours trying to convince her to reconsider her opinion on Germany's controversial tactics during the Second World War. Tactics. Controversial. Uh, are we do it about the Holocaust? <laughs> it's the tactics that Graham himself did not see as controversial at all. He even asserted that Britain's troubles with Northern Ireland and the IRA could be solved in the same way that Germany had solved its problems problems with the Jews. Bro. <laughs> that is insane. So you need to you need to go back to hospital. You need to go to regular big boy prison. They need to put you in that glass box underneath that scary prison in the UK. Or maybe America will take you to one of their scary prisons. You can take Ted Kaczynski's old cell. I mean, obviously, I know the timeline's different on this, but this is where he belongs. And as if that wasn't concerning enough for her, Graham also failed to apologize or show remorse for what he had done to their family. At times, he even seemed to revel in it. The day after arriving at Hemel Hampstead, Graham made the journey back to their childhood home in Neesden, where he surprised his his former neighbors with a visit just to talk about his crimes and why he had committed them. He then visited his old primary school, spoke with the headmaster about poisoning his fellow students, and then returned to the shop where he had purchased the antimony many years earlier to chat with the staff and other customers. He paraded himself around like a celebrity on a comeback tour. He had no interest in allowing his crimes to be forgotten. He wanted to be remembered, and he enjoyed watching the horrifying looks wash over their faces as they all slowly realized who he was. Overall, as I said, these actions did little to calm Winifred's nerves, and she quickly suggested that Graham find a new place to stay. Very good idea. I mean, like, don't see Graham again. I don't want to see, I know he's my brother, but he's dangerous. He's poisoning every, he's poisoned me. He poisoned dad, he killed stepmom. Around a week after his release, after he had finished reveling in his glory days, Graham then began looking for work and eventually landed an interview for a shopkeeper position at a photography development firm called John Hadland Laboratories in Bovington, Hertfordshire. The shop, which carried many different chemicals used for photography development, should have known better than to consider a man like Graham due to his history. However, they did consider him because Hadlin Labs' management team was completely unaware of who Graham was and what he had done. During his interview, Graham told the store's retail manager, Bob Eggle, he had suffered a severe mental breakdown after the death of his stepmother and had been admitted to Broadmoor for treatment. This explained his lack of education and work experience, although Graham purposefully did not mention how Molly had died or anything about his love of poisons. Although this seems like the sort of weird thing that the guy would do, be like, I'm amazing with poisons. I've poisoned so many people. I'm an absolute poisoning legend. It sounds like he's braggadocious. To prove that he was completely cured, Graham then presented a letter from Dr. Rudwin to state that he had made an extremely full recovery and made no mention whatsoever of Graham's history as a poisoner. Graham was then hired and ordered to begin work immediately. When Graham's co-workers first met him, they saw a man who was short, yet imposing, ostensibly harmless, yet unnerving, and when he stared at them, they felt their skin crawling but had no idea why. This was who Graham was after spending so many years locked away in Broadmoor. He couldn't force himself to appear normal, and despite his best attempts to hide his many disconcerting behaviors, he was failing miserably, and most of his co-workers wanted nothing to do with him. However, Graham did find a friend in his new manager, Bob Eggle, as well as another man named Fred Biggs, one of the store's other supervisors. These men had both taken pity on poor Graham and went out of their way to chat with the strange young man and give him cigarettes and a small amount of money. Grateful for their kindness, Graham then used these funds to rent a spot at a nearby hostel. While living there, he met fellow resident Trevor Sparks, a football enthusiast and casual football player who Graham began enjoying an occasional beer with after work at the local pub. Now, had Graham been truly reformed, this would have been a golden opportunity for him. He had a job, he had a place to live, and new friends. He was having moderate success reintegrating into normal society. People want to be friends with a guy with a, with a Charlie Chaplin moustache and a, a, a racist symbol on his arm. <laughs> it's like, yeah, let's go have a beer, shall we? It's like, yes, my friends! 
but also get those Jews. But as we already discussed, Graham never intended to stop poisoning people, and he was about to make good on the threat that he made shortly before leaving Broadmoor. After deciding it would be too risky to start stealing chemicals from his employer right away, Graham attempted to purchase antimony from a local chemist shop, but was denied because the shopkeeper recognized him. Oh my god. It's like, oh, that's the guy's the poisoner, and he's coming in to buy poison. Call the police! Undeterred, Graham then moved to a more distant shop in London, on the west side, where he succeeded in purchasing a large amount of the metallic powder under the same false name that he'd used as a child, M. E. Evans. He also presented the shopkeeper with a fake ID and said that he was purchasing the powder for research purposes. Okay, well, there you go. That's how you get on the poison register. You just use a fake ID, apparently. A few days later, many of Graham's new friends and colleagues began to fall ill. First, while out drinking with Graham after work one evening, Trevor Sparks suddenly began vomiting violently after he was handed a glass of water by Graham moments earlier. With this night now effectively ruins, the pair then started back toward their hostel. By the time they made it to the front door, Trevor was clutching his stomach in pain and struggling to breathe. Pretending to care for the man, Graham then helped Trevor inside his room and suggested that he try drinking some wine to settle his stomach. Moments later, Graham handed him a glass spiked with more antimony. As Trevor sipped it, his face and testicles began to swell painfully, and his intense vomiting was soon accompanied by diarrhea. Oh my god, he's getting totally ruined. Over the next few weeks, Trevor's health continued to worsen until one day during a football match, he completely lost control of his legs and collapsed onto the field. He was then taken to hospital, but doctors were unable to help him. They had no idea how a man's health could deteriorate so rapidly. Eventually, they blamed it on environmental factors, and as Trevor's health began to improve, advised him to be more careful. They never realized that his symptoms were the result of a combination of antimony and thallium, the latter of which Graham had stolen from his work. This was, if you recall, the same poison Graham had used to kill Molly nearly a decade earlier. One evening, while Trevor was still in hospital, Graham also met another pub regular named Howard Grodnow, and as the pair shared a drink together, their conversations bounced between normal pub topics such as football women and Graham's deep love for chemistry and death. <laughs> Overall, just normal night out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, look at that pretty lady. I'd poison the shit out of her. <laughs> okay. However, later that night, after returning home, Howard began experiencing severe chest pains and aches across his entire body. These pains were excruciating, persisted for months, and could not be alleviated by medical intervention. He would not find out what had happened for him to him for another full year, and he would continue to suffer throughout that entire time. Back at Graham's workplace, several of the store's longtime employees were also beginning to show strange symptoms, and this is because Graham had decided to target the one thing that no true brick can turn down. A fresh cup of tea. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a bad British person because I'm generally much more a coffee man. I like tea. Like, I drink tea like maybe once a month, but I drink coffee every day. It's my life force. Yes, shortly before starting his new job, Graham had graciously offered to make tea for the entire staff, and since they'd enjoyed it so much, this act of selfishness became a recurring thing. This is how he earned the name the Teacup Poisoner. Now, cleverly, Graham didn't poison the entire staff's tea at once using the same substance, because that would have been too obvious. Instead, because each of his co-workers had their own cups, Graham was able to select a single target at a time and monitor their symptoms as they slowly grew ill. He was also careful not to use the same type or amount of poison on multiple people, because he didn't want them to start presenting with the same symptoms and have either the local doctors or police notice a pattern. To keep track of how much of a substance he'd given to each of them and to document their symptoms, Graham also purchased a new diary to make notes in. And by make notes, we mean Graham purchased a diary to literally write down his crimes. Graham, what are you doing? The first person that Graham targeted at his workplace was Bob Eggle, his direct supervisor. This was the man who had kindly given him cigarettes and money when he had neither. Graham repaid the man's kindness by gradually slipping him small amounts of thallium. While working together, Graham also learned that Bob Eggle was a veteran of the Second World War and had been present at the evacuation of Dunkirk. And if you'll allow me to put on my War of Graphics hat for a brief moment, I'll explain why that is relevant. War of Graphics is another YouTube channel that I do. You can check it out if you want to. The evacuation at Dunkirk was a nightmare emergency that took place from May the 26th to June the 4th, 1940, where over 338,000 Allied soldiers were rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk, France. It was a hellish few days, and those that survived, like Bob Eggle, returned with tales that were as heartbreaking as they were terrifying. As someone who was very interested in the Second World War, Graham began asking a litany of personal and uncomfortable questions about Eggle's time as a soldier, and brought the subject up far too often for anyone's comfort. Bro, bro, Graham, do you not know the phrase? Don't talk about the war. <laughs> it's a phrase for a reason, Graham. Stiff up a lip, Graham. We don't talk about this stuff in Britain. Keep your mouth shut. Don't ask questions. Let everyone suffer in their own personal misery and never bring it up again. Just bury it deep inside you like a good British chap, okay? Are you okay, boys? These conversations became especially awkward for Egel and those who overheard them after Graham was seen reading German propaganda in the break room and was overheard giving his opinion on the war, an opinion that was not a popular one amongst British World War II veterans. This sounds like a guy who's going to get the shit likes today. You get the shit beaten out of you at some point. Someone's going to be like, bruh, you're dressing like a Nazi, bruh. <laughs> you're going to get the shit 
beat it out of you. Post war, and there's a lot of dudes who have seen some shit and are all traumatized and now to like fight and throw down and just don't give a shit. Bro, how have you not got beaten to death yet? It's a Christmas miracle. Now, it's not entirely clear if Graham chose Egil as his first workplace victim because of the man's military service and differing ideology. However, it does seem likely for reasons that will be obvious very soon. Over the next couple of weeks, Egil began to suffer from frequent stomach problems, and while he didn't think anything of them at first, he was eventually forced to take several days off of work due to uncomfortable diarrhea. While he was away, his condition quickly improved, but once he returned, so did his symptoms. He was then forced to take another full week off because he believed that he had not given himself enough time off to fully recover. During this unexpected absence, Eggles' assistant, Ron Hewitt, stepped up to take over his responsibilities, which also earned him the honor of being Young's next target for experimentation. After drinking Graham's tea, he too grew ill and was forced to take time off as well. Ron would end up not returning to work at all, as he was already in the process of working out his notice and he missed all of his final days of work due to illness. This would end up being the best outcome possible for him in the end, as he did not suffer any long-term effects of the single dose. Once Eggles returned to Hadlands for a second time, his health had improved so dramatically that he thought he was in the clear. However, after accepting another cup of Graham's tea, a cup that had been purposefully loaded with a lethal amount of thallium, he once again became sick to his stomach, lost feeling in his arms and legs, and was rushed away to hospital, where he soon became paralyzed and eventually passed away ten days later on July the 7th, 1971. Graham had officially taken another, another life and he reveled in it. At several points throughout Eggles' stay in hospital, he called the nurse's line to check up on him, once remarking that it was a shame that someone who had gone through so much during the war should suffer so tragically. He even attended Eggles' cremation service, where he brought up the man's military service with many of his grieving friends and relatives. Thankfully, nobody else was poisoned this time. When Graham returned to work, he was temporarily promoted to Eggles' position because there was simply no one left to fill it after Hewitt's departure. Graham had only been working at Hadland's labs for a short time, and he was now managing the entire storefront with almost no experience. Surprisingly, the store didn't immediately fall apart, and Graham's performance as manager was seen as perfectly adequate. He even managed to find some time to continue his daily routine of preparing tea for the entire staff, which had been causing several other employees to be plagued by random unexplained illnesses that seemed to come and go without reason. For instance, Diana Smart, a woman whom Graham found to be deeply irritating, would frequently become nauseous halfway through her workday and was forced to return home early. In his diary, Graham wrote, Diana irritated me yesterday, so I packed her off with an attack of sickness. I only gave her something to shake her up. I now regret that I didn't give her a larger dose capable of laying her up for a few days. Oh, Graham, you're writing down so many of your crimes, Graham. After this, Jethro Bat, another of Graham's co-workers who would sometimes give him rides home after work, also started suffering from stomach pains after drinking a cup of coffee prepared for him by Graham. For some reason, Graham had become heavily upset with Bat, and the dose he administered was large enough to kill the man. However, the coffee did not mask the taste as well as the tea did, and Bat detected something was wrong soon after the bitter liquid touched his tongue. He tossed the remainder and graham jokingly asked do you think i'm trying to poison you <laughs> holy shit the answer is yes an hour later bat was rushed to the hospital after he begun experiencing chest and leg pains graham's dose had been so high that even putting a tiny sip of the liquid in his mouth momentarily had caused bat to suffer a mild heart attack holy shit Doctors were once again unable to detect the poison in his system. After this failure, Graham began fearing that he would soon be caught if another person at Hadlands died, so he started reducing the dosage that he put in the tea, and as a result, many of the staff began to suffer new symptoms caused by long-term exposure. Impotence, skin discoloration and peeling, and rapid hair loss were all common. For any customers who endured Hadlands, it must have seemed as if a zombie apocalypse had occurred and gone unnoticed. I mean, at some point, aren't the people going to be get together? And I mean, poisoning's not the first thing you jump to, right? But you would be, oh, maybe there's an environmental hazard. Maybe something. Maybe there's something in the air. Maybe there's some poison. Maybe one of these chemicals is poisoning us that we use in like the the photo lab or whatever. Surely you're all sick, and when you go home, you get better. Use your big brain. Doctor House would be all over this shit. Exterminating the bug. Now, by this point, you must be wondering why no one outside Hadlands had managed to put two and two together, but you should know that there's a decent reason for it. Okay, Matthew, I'm ready for it. People in town were noticing an uptick in the number of illnesses, and local health experts had labeled the phenomenon the Bevington Bug. However, the reason that no one had been able to trace the illnesses back to Hadlands or to Graham himself was simply a matter of bad luck. You see, there was another unknown illness going around at the same time as Graham's crime spree, and many local children and their parents had recently become sick. They were presenting with stomach symptoms that were very similar to the ones 
conditions commonly seen at Hadlands, and naturally, medical professionals assumed that the bulk of the town's symptoms were all directly related to one thing. They were too busy focusing on the children and their school to notice the startlingly large numbers of people that were dying and falling ill at Hadlands. As for non-health experts, many suspected that the town's tap water might be to blame, and that's because a decade prior, contaminated tap water had caused several unpleasant deaths throughout the town, and people had not forgotten. Many began boiling the water before consuming it around this time as a precaution. Okay, this is completely for, like legit. I'm like, how did they get away with this? How did they not think something was wrong? And then it's just like, oh no, there's just something, there's a wider problem where we're just especially affected by it. That's crazy. Like... <laughs> What are the odds? Eventually, however, the signs became too obvious to ignore, and employees at Hadlands began to complain to management. Diana, the woman who Graham had poisoned because he found her irritating, even singled Graham out personally during a meeting with her boss because she'd noticed that Graham was the only person immune from the symptoms that were plaguing the rest of the staff. It is suspicious, isn't it? She suggested that he must be an immune carrier of some horrible unknown disease. Oh, Diana, so close, but so far. While another employee cited Graham's well-known interest in poisons and blamed him for spiking their food and drinks. Bang on. Who was that? Just a random other employee? Yes. These accusations, however, were not the prevailing theory, and the most common belief among Hadland's employees was the substances they all worked with every day, the harsh chemicals used in photography development, were to blame. Yeah, that would be a very reasonable, that's what I said, like an environmental factor. I think I even mentioned the photography chemicals. It wasn't a bad theory, and management remained unconvinced. The store's director, Godfrey Froster, even made a statement claiming that there were no health risks to working at Hadlands and that the chemicals on site were harmless so long as everyone handled them appropriately. Well, yeah, cyanide is harmless if it's handled appropriately. You just don't eat it, Godfrey. It's like covering your ass there, Godfrey. Come on, do, do better. This did little to calm everyone's nerves as they continued to get visibly weaker, thinner, bolder, and angrier. Eventually, Fred Biggs, another of the store's employees, became so ill so quickly that he had to be rushed away to hospital because his skin was beginning to peel off in strips and he couldn't bear the weight of his own clothes against his body. Oh, bro. For nearly three weeks, the man was observed carefully by doctors as he lay in agony until, on November the 19th, he passed away and became Graham's next victim. Back at Adlands, as the news of Biggs's death spread, fears of chemical exposure resurfaced, and Godfrey Foster decided to contact the physician who had cared for Biggs, Dr. Ian Anderson. Dr. Anderson, who was sure that something was going on at Hadlands but had not yet identified the cause of Biggs's death, attempted to alleviate the staff's worries. He reiterated what Godfrey Foster had said about the chemicals at Hadlands being safe, and that he had found no evidence that, had, that Biggs's death had been caused by exposure to heavy metals. The staff were once again unsure and began voicing their concerns. However, there was one man who really wasn't buying the doctor's excuses. Graham suggested thallium poisoning. <laughs> Graham, what the f*** are you doing? You literally break the rules on purpose. How do you stay free? For You're writing them down in a diary. They're like, the doctor's like, oh, I don't know what this is. And he's like, well, in his mind, I poisoned him with thallium. And then in his mouth, have you considered the substance he himself had dosed Biggs with directly before his admission to hospital, but Dr. Anderson dismissed Graham's concerns by saying that it simply wasn't possible. Graham then looked the doctor up and down, asked several more very specific questions that proved he had an intimate knowledge of thallium's effects on the human body, and after some research, Dr. Anderson began to reconsider. So he just wants to appear smart? That's why he's saying, it's like, oh, that looks like thallium poisoning to me. <laughs> like thinking it makes him look clever, but it just makes him look guilty. The store clerk had a point. Back inside Godfrey Foster's office, Dr. Anderson brought up his newfound concerns surrounding thallium poisoning, along with another much more pressing concern. The fact that one of Foster's low-wage, undereducated store clerks somehow knew more about thallium poisoning than he did a fully trained medical doctor. Later that day, police arrived at Hadlands with some very important questions and realized that the mysterious illness had all started around the same time that Graham had been hired, and yes, thallium poisoning did seem like Biggs's most likely cause of death. With their sights now set on the young store clerk, what a surprise! The police then visited the hostel where Graham was staying, but found that he was not there. It was a Saturday and Graham had gone to visit his aunt and uncle, the pair who had raised him until the age of two, and he was not due back that day. After being given access to his flat by the hostel's management, they found all the trappings of a cereal poisoner, along with a few other unsavory items. The first thing that immediately stood out to them was the walls. They were covered with pictures of German politicians and scientists, homemade flags. I wonder what sort of flag that was. Books and symbols. Symbols from the era. <laughs> and many sketches of frail, gaunt people with swollen faces who were clutching their throats as if they'd been, well, poisoned. Oh my god, Graham. Could you, you just, <laughs> you're trying to look as guilty as 
But could it be the little neo-Nazi rolls around? He's never sick, but we're all sick. And he keeps mentioning that he's poisoning us. Could it be him? Could it possibly be him? Maybe it's him. They then discovered an indoor garden on the windowsill that housed many plants that could be used to produce arsenic and various other toxic substances. Beside it, they found a makeshift lab comprised of beakers, bottles, vials, tubing, and glass jars filled with unknown liquids and powders. It was all very startling. However, the piece of Graham's evidence that tied everything in the room together was Graham's diary. Oh, what? Writing down his crimes got him in trouble? Who would ever think that that was possible. Wow, that's weird, isn't it? From underneath Graham's bed, police retrieved a tiny bound notebook that contains the full details of his experiments. It included the names and information of his victims in the form of makeshift medical charts, detailed breakdowns about the doses they had been administered, graphs and charts used to calculate those doses, and timelines of their symptoms and other gruesome details about their deaths. It was an indisputable gold mine that evidenced premeditation, motive, method, and everything else the police would need to prosecute Graham for his crimes. In all, there were records from dozens of people, many of which were still suffering major complications in hospitals and homes all around Bovington. Graham Young was arrested at his aunt's house later that night around midnight, and when the handcuffs were placed on his wrist, he asked, which one are you doing me for? Oh, Graham. <laughs> at this point, you don't say, oh, which one is this for? Because there are so many. What you do is you say, lawyer, 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 lawyer. Later, inside an interrogation room, Graham admitted to everything forthright. Over 70 victims in all, he said, and even finally confessed to murdering his stepmother, Molly, after sitting on the secret for over a decade. Although confessed is not exactly the right word, as police say Graham was bragging throughout the entire conversation about how, at only 14 years old, he'd committed the perfect murder and gotten away with it without ever being suspected of anything. He was also very proud and boastful about being the first ever British person to use thallium as a poison. He felt entirely comfortable telling the officers this because he'd already accomplished everything he wanted to in life. He had done what Charles Palmer had done better even, and he had accepted the fact that he would live out the rest of his days behind bars. Graham's words and attitude had shocked the police. However, when they requested that he sign a written confession, Graham reportedly laughed in their faces, and by the time the trial rolled around, he had completely changed his story. In court, Graham asserted that although he did confess, he had done so because his interrogators had stripped him down to his underwear and starved him. He also claimed that the diary found in his room was nothing more than a fictional account of how he wished he could poison his co-workers and that he had not actually done it. Well, Graham, the problem is... It's a diary. So they'll be like, Poison Sally, 15th of May. And then it'll be like, Okay, well, the police are like, when did Sally get by? Fifth, when did Fat Sally fall sick on 15th of May? Well, either it's the biggest coincidence in the world, Graham. <laughs> Uh, that, there's not reasonable doubt there, Graham. I'm sorry. You're going to prison forever. Eventually, however, toxicology reports confirmed that Briggs had died of thallium poisoning, as Graham had suggested to Dr. Anderson, and although police were never able to establish a clear-cut motive other than Graham's weak, I wanted to see what happened story, Graham was eventually convicted of two counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of administering poison. He was given four life sentences, with an additional ten years tacked on for good measure. After learning of his son's actions, Frederick Young is said to have torn his son's birth certificate to shreds, cursing him forever being born. Graham died inside Parkhurst Prison on August 1, 1990, when he was only 42 years old. His official cause of death was ruled as a heart attack. However, many have speculated that Graham Young's final victim might have been himself. Dismembered Appendices Number 1. In addition to Graham Young, Broadmoor Hospital has housed many other famous serial killers throughout the years, including Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, David Copeland, the London Nail Bomber, Daniel Gonzalez, the Freddy Krueger Killer, and James Kelly, the man who's considered by some to be Jack the Ripper. Number 2. After his sentencing, Graham made it known that he would like to have a waxwork dummy of his head placed on display at Madame Tussauds' Chamber of Horrors alongside his idols, Charles Palmer and Hawley Crippen. Yeah, how about we don't do that? Years later, his request was granted, although by that point, Palmer's head had already been removed and he was instead situated between Hawley Crippen and John Hay, the acid bath murderer. How about we stop honoring? Like, if they want this, don't do it. Don't put... No. Number three. While awaiting his trial, Graham once offered his lawyer a piece of cake while meeting with him inside a prison conference room to discuss his defense strategy. Aware of the crimes for which his client was accused, his lawyer initially rejected it. However, he reconsidered after Graham reportedly said, Come on, I won't poison my lawyer. The man ate the cake and was completely fine afterwards. And that is where we end today's episode. Thank you for being here. Prison for life. Nice ending. Well deserved. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed this show, please do leave it a review. If you're watching on YouTube, hello there. Subscribe, and I'll see you next time. 